My name is Paul Bowsted, and I'm the VP of Product and Architecture for Dolby's developer platform, Dolby IO. I'll be talking about spatial communications in virtual environments. This is an area that I'm particularly passionate about. I started working in this area back in 2004 when I founded a small startup company called Spatial Voice. We were looking at ways of replicating natural group communications in social gatherings in virtual environments. We ended up focusing on ga the games industry and built server infrastructures for spatial voice in massively multiplayer games. We later joined Dolby and continued the work. In this presentation, I'll talk about Dolby's experience in spatial communications at scale in virtual environments. By scale, I mean by supporting millions of concurrent users, as well as supporting virtual environments with many talkers within hearing range, replicating large social gatherings online. I'll start with a brief discussion of how spatial rendering improves intelligibility. I'll then talk about some of the large-scale deployments that we've done. I'll go on to talk about speaker selection and how many people you need to hear around you. This will lead to a discussion about server implementation options. Then I'll briefly touch on the audio chain and some important considerations around audio capture. I'll then finish by talking about where we're going next. So why is spatial rendering important for real-time communications? It does add realism to communicating in virtual environments. However, more importantly, it can significantly boost intelligibility. Spatial rendering is key for us communicating effectively in the presence of other surrounding voices and noises. I want to briefly touch on why. At in-person social gatherings, like a party or a networking event at a conference, there's a lot of overlapping speech. Studies show that in four to eight person conversations, 10% of words overlap and 40% of talk bursts contain overlapping speech from other people in the same conversation. The amount of overlapping speech increases significantly if you include affirmations and laughter. These additional audio cues are really important to help you understand how people are reacting to the conversation. It adds additional context. This overlapping speech and affirmations make the conversation much more engaging and natural. In social gatherings, you'll also hear other conversations in the background, but you're still able to focus on the conversation that you're involved in. However, online conferences don't work at all well with overlapping speech. It makes it much harder to understand what's going on, so people will avoid it, and conversations become quite stilted. These conversations, online meetings, can be very fatiguing, and they're well known for being fatiguing. We seem to deal with overlapping speech much better in the real world than online. A whole area of research called auditory scene analysis looks at how our brain can form a mental representation of the world around us, how we separate the audio we hear into recognizable sounds. One of the cues that helps us separate sounds and voices is its spatial location, represented by a difference in phase and volume heard by each of your ears. One of the earliest studies looking at how we understand overlapping speech in the real world was published in 1953 by Colin Cherry. Colin coined the phrase, the cocktail party problem, which is how can we easily understand a particular voice in the presence of many other talkers in a crowd? He did a couple of experiments to explore the impact of spatial separation of voices. In experiment one, two spoken passages were mixed together linearly and played to the participant. The subject was asked to listen to just one of the passages and repeat what they heard. The subjects had great difficulty doing this and made lots of errors. And Cherry noted that he was surprised by how stressful this activity was for these participants. In the second test, phrase one was played in one ear and phrase two was played in another. The subject was asked to repeat one of the phrases while they're listening to both. The subject had no difficulty in this case, completing the task and had very few errors. The subjects were then asked about the content of phrase two and they couldn't recall it at all. It was as if their brains had filtered it out. Cherry's experiments here illustrate a really interesting phenomenon known as spatial release from masking. And this is our brain's natural ability to use spatial separation to easily focus on a particular voice and filter out other voices and sounds at different locations around us. Since these early experiments, the psychoacoustics research community has done a significant amount of work studying how we understand the audio around us and how we can communicate effectively in the presence of other voices and noises. 
However, the combination of this spatial release from masking effect as well as distance attenuation really enables us to understand complex audio scenes in a virtual world. Next, I want to talk a bit about our experience implementing spatial communications at scale. In 2007, we released the spatial voice server and client for communications in massively multiplayer games. The product name was Dolby Axon. We supported spatial rendering, distance attenuation, and occlusion from in-game geometry. Each player sent their real-time voice to the server, we rendered a spatial scene for each player, including everyone within their virtual hearing range. We then sent that scene back to the clients. We used a custom spatial codec that we built, which was optimized for low-cost spatial mixing, and we supported up to 5,000 players in one single continuous virtual environment on a single server. 5,000 was important at the time. This was the largest shard in a massively multiplayer game. A shard is an instance of the world. Massively multiplayer games would generally have many shards um, running at any one time. The first game we deployed was a game called Mission Against Terror, a first person shooter in China. The first beta of the product had 40,000 concurrent users. The next deployment was in 2009 for a game in China called ZT Online. They were effectively Chinese World of Warcraft equivalent. They had around 2 million peak concurrent users at the time in many parallel game shards. With these games, our customers ran the servers and we helped them build the, the server infrastructure. Later, we built our own cloud voice service that hosted spatial voice for games. Customers included Electronic Arts with their game Need for Speed World and, we gained, and, and other games. And we gained significant experience in building scalable spatial communication systems. Before discussing design choices, I want to talk about what we want from a spatial scene and virtual environment. Here I'm considering social scenes like a networking event at a conference or an online party. You need to be able to communicate effectively with people nearby. This is obviously the highest priority. However, you may be communicating with someone who is not the closest. Someone may yell at you across the room. In these circumstances, you want to hear them and respond. You want to make sure you have two-way communication, even if someone is you know, far away to your right. Some design choices we talk about later can lead to one-way communication, which is something you don't want. However, of course, you should be able to mute someone if they're abusive. Everyone really does need to have an individual scene. You want to be able to hear conversations in the distance. If there's something exciting happening around you, you should hear it. If there are multiple conversations happening around you, you want to hear the energy of the room around you as well. You don't want to have abrupt changes in the scene. You don't want voices to appear and disappear suddenly as you're walking around. You also want a quick response to head rotation. You can cope with small lags in other avatars' voices if they're walking around you. However, if you rot your head, rotate your head, you want the change to happen almost instantly. This is particularly important if you're wearing a VR headset, for example. So how do you select who you can hear? In online conferencing, speaker selection is really simple. Because you receive a mono mix of the talkers in a conference, you can aggressively cull voices to make the service much cheaper to deliver. Most conferencing services use N loudest mixing or forwarding with N set to three. N loudest mixing means that the conference service will only mix or forward the three loudest voices to each listener. You don't really notice quieter talkers disappearing from the mix because the louder talkers mask them you know, while they're cutting in and out. With spatially rendered voice, you do notice quiet talkers cutting in and out. For example, in this scene here, if we're using three loudest, the red avatar on the left is speaking quietly, the green avatar can hear them across to the left. However, if someone else talks louder in front and the green listener no longer hears the red talker, if this red talker cuts in and out, it's quite a disturbing experience. It seems like a bug. Instead of N loudest, you need to choose a different speaker selection method. Two common options for who you hear are N closest talkers, as well as all talkers within a fixed hearing range. With the N closest talkers, you would subscribe to the voice of the N closest avatars. In the example here, I show N is five. The green avatar can hear a conversation off to his left, but can't hear the rest of the room. 
The red avatar can hear parts of two conversations off in the distance. However, you'll notice that the red avatar can hear the green avatar, but the green avatar can't hear the red avatar. This is one-way communication and can be very disturbing to users. If you can't hear someone, it's a reasonable assumption that they can't hear you. And so if you speak and they hear you, it, it, can, it can lead to embarrassing things. I know from my days working in conferencing, one-way audio is always seen as a very high priority bug to fix. The other option is to pick a hearing range. This is a good option because it's very predictable to the users. If you can hear someone, then they can hear you. If you want to limit the number of voice streams you receive and decode, then you really need to pick a short hearing range, which I show here. In this case, the green avatar still hears most of the conversation he did before, but the world is silent to the red avatar. However, at least you don't have one-way audio. With a small hearing range, you'll have voices appear and disappear as you walk around, as they come in and out of your hearing range. This isn't a great experience as well. And for the red avatar, being in a space, seeing people around, but hearing nothing is not a great experience. Obviously, the best option is choosing a large hearing range. You want to choose a hearing range that seems appropriate for the virtual environment you're in. You want to hear far enough so the attenuation profile makes the talker sound soft at the edge of the hearing range, and that soft voice seems appropriate for that distance. In this case, the green avatar can hear the whole room. He could also choose to turn and focus the conversation next to him, or he could hear the red avatar call out to him across the room and he can go over and talk to them. Now the problem with a long hearing range is it can be costly to deliver, particularly if you have 50 or so people within a hearing range which makes sense for the virtual environment that you're in. I want to talk a bit about different network and server options for real-time communication delivery, how you build this server. There are three main delivery architectures, peer-to-peer, -peer, forwarding or proxy, and mixing. On the left, I show peer-to-peer -peer delivery. Each user sends their real-time audio directly to each listener that can hear them. The voices would be rendered locally on each of the listener's computers. This has two main issues. Firstly, upstream bandwidth usage. Sending a large number of super wideband open streams will consume significant upstream bandwidth. And consumer broadband internet is still asymmetrical in much of the world and upstream bandwidth is limited. More importantly, it exposes your IP address to anyone who can hear you in the virtual environment, which is a major security issue. Peer-to-peer -peer used to be common, but most consumer services have moved away from this sort of delivery approach. When Skype was peer-to-peer, -peer, gamers that used it were often the subject of denial of service attacks because their IP addresses were exposed. Using a forwarding server is a solution to the upstream bandwidth and IP address issues of peer-to-peer. With a forwarding server, each user would send their real-time voice to a server. Then the listeners would subscribe to the streams they want to hear. This may not scale well, particularly if you have a lot of people within your hearing range. You would need to receive an audio stream from each person that you can hear. You're also getting access to all the individual streams. So a hack client could be used to eavesdrop on someone who, had, who is at the edge of, their, of your hearing range. Um, that may not be otherwise audible because other conversations may be happening between the listener and the speaker. The other solution is mixing. Each client sends an audio stream to the server. The server does a spatial mix of the audio for each listener and sends it back. This is obviously the most complex solution, but does allow for long hearing ranges and dense audio scenes, even on consumer devices which are network and CPU constrained. This is the solution we use for our large-scale implementations that I discussed earlier. Implementing the spatial mixing server is a whole other topic. We know of two different approaches that people are using. You can render a virtual surround stereo stream in the server for playback on listener clients with stereo headphones, or you can use a surround or multi-channel spatial codec in the server. For the virtual surround mixing approach, each client sends a mono stream to the server. The server creates a spatial mix for each listener by encoding each talker in the scene using a head-related transfer function, or HRTF, and then mixing them into a stereo stream and sending them back to the listener. 
A head-related transfer function calculates the audio each ear would hear from a sound being played spatially around the listener. It simulates the phase and magnitude differences between what you would hear from your left and right ear based upon the position of a sound being played, as well as the shape of your head and ears. This approach is computationally expensive and a simple HRTF function would generally be used. It also doesn't allow for easy client-side rotation. The other option to use is a multi-channel spatial codec. This is the option we took. Again, each user sends a mono stream to the server. For each listener, the server mixes voices into a spatial codec based upon the relative positions of the avatars and sends that back to the listeners. We then render the audio scene on the listener's computer based upon their playback hardware. So we can play back on headphones or speakers. Using a spatial codec also allows for fast client-side rotation. To do this at scale, we implemented a custom spatial codec that is low cost to mix in a server. We talked about spatial rendering, speaker selection, and building a spatial mixing server. There are many other considerations, including optimizing the audio chain for this use case. In particular, noise suppression is crucial. You need silence between talk bursts. If you don't have silence between talk bursts and mix residual noise from each user, you increase the noise floor and reduce intelligibility. Environmental noise coming from other avatars' real-world spaces also kills immersion. You need a very different set point for what you would use for point-to-point -point communications. For point-to-point -point communications, transparency is beneficial and the penalty of noise breaking through is significantly less. We use a combination of machine learning voice activity detectors as well as AI noise suppression and a traditional noise suppressor to get silence between talk bursts. Getting voice levels correct is equally as important. If you don't get voice leveling correct, distance attenuation is completely ineffective. In the above examples, we talk about voice. We need equivalent algorithms for non-voice and music. If you have someone playing music live into a space, such as playing a guitar into their phone, you need to level that correctly to fit into the scene and sound appropriately loud based upon your distance from it. Noise suppression and leveling designed for voice is really not appropriate for music. We have a specialized input chain designed for real-time music capture. Echo suppression also becomes more challenging in a busy virtual environment. You end up with a lot of double talk, particularly if you have lots of overlapping speech and music being played into the environment. You need an echo suppressor with really good du duplex performance. Otherwise, you hear a lot of echo suppression artifacts. So what's next? We learned a lot from these large-scale deployments. And we're starting to make these virtual world communication features that we had from Axon available through our developer platform. We just released the first version of our new Spatial Voice APIs for virtual worlds at the end of January. And we just started working and learning from some very interesting companies that are creating compelling online social entertainment experiences. We're working with a company that's creating an online comedy platform with a spatial virtual audience. They enable the comedian to hear and react to the audience spatially rendered in front of them in real time. Interacting with the audience is obviously important for comedians. We're also engaging with companies building a virtual world concert experience with audience that can experience the concert together. We're working with a wide range of other companies building social experiences, VR collaboration platforms, and many other exciting applications. At Dolby, we're really interested in this intersection between entertainment and communications. And we really want to bring interaction back into online events. I love the idea of making online virtual concerts as compelling to attend online as being there in person by enabling innovators to add compelling social and interactive elements to online events where the artists can play live on stage to a virtual audience that is dancing, cheering, yelling, talking to each other, and the musician can hear and see all this and react in real time to them and feed, feed off the energy. Um, thank you for watching, and I'm really happy to answer any questions during question time or afterwards reach out to me. I'm happy to talk anyone, to anyone about this space. Thank you.